Hello and welcome to this video on the slowly growing future of plants that think and communicate in a meaningful way. The horror black comedy musical film called The Little Shop of Horrors can be simply summarised as following. The customers of a florist shop are dwindling and they desperately need something to get more business. The love interest of the musical suggests the use of an interesting and unusual plant, this plant having been named Audrey II after the love interest. The protagonist, Seymour, brings in the plant, which, as a consequence, increases business to the florist store. The plant was obtained under weird circumstances, including buying it from a Chinese flower shop during a solar eclipse. Unfortunately, the plant begins to wither and die. Apparently, the plant needs blood to survive. After the plant begins to develop a little bit, it begins to talk, and we mean literally talk. It demands more blood, and this naturally leads to a situation in which the protagonist is unable to supply enough blood. This leads to them murdering people and feeding them to the plant, it's something of a Faustian bargain. The plant then demands more and more, as it needs more food to survive as it gets bigger. Due to various factors, the protagonist named Seymour eventually gives in and starts killing people and feeding them to Audrey II. What is stated at the end is that Audrey II is actually an alien, and that they are there to basically make a life for themselves, which means at the cost of others. For what is meant to be a black comedy, The Little Shop of Horrors is closer to reality than you might think with plans that can communicate, interact with the environment, learn, and solve problems. It's worth noting that in at least the unofficial ending to the musical, Audrey actually survives and goes off to begin conquering the world defeating militaries left, right, and centre. This makes clear that they either have to have problem-solving skills, a memory, the ability to learn, and communication of some sort. These are all factors that we are beginning to see and be able to observe and measure in plants in our own world. Admittedly, these plants aren't anywhere near as jingoist, but nonetheless, the perception that we have of consciousness and reality is fundamentally being questioned by some of this research. Most people are familiar with the ability of a plant to interact with their environment, the obvious example being a Venus flytrap which snaps shut at contact with insects. A thinking, talking and acting plant is substantially more than just an action that verges on reflex. As some may know, plants will grow differently in response to music, physical contact and more stimuli. This is not the behaviour of a passive life form. The problem we have here is how to define life, and more importantly how to define conscious life. Through research and experimentation, the four characteristics we mentioned can be both attributed to plants and considered some degree of consciousness, communication, learning, Problem solving, memory, and recall. All of this is impressive if true, as plants have no central nervous system, nor neurons to transmit signals as the human body, or any animal for that matter, has. While it is true bacteria and other single celled organisms can respond to their environment, the way they react is very different to the way more complex organisms react, and especially multicellular ones. The idea of plant intelligence has been controversial to say the least. It was first described in at least what you could call substantive detail and with evidence to back it up in 2003. In the 17 years since then it's been criticised and supported with parties on each side trying to push their position. The exact way that plants sense and react is an unknown mystery. And this is one of the issues in some of these claims, both for and against it. As mentioned, they don't have nerves. 
This means they need another way to send signals around their body. They do have these, and primarily they are electrical signals similar to a neuron. They also produce neurotransmitters of a sort. In the human body, we rely on dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, and more. Plants themselves produce their own body of neurotransmitters, which achieve some of the same effect. Some research has been done to try and figure out whether or not plants can learn. One of these is both well known and considered somewhat controversial, as the claimed conclusion that the plant has learned has not been substantiated to everyone's satisfaction. The short version of this study was simply this. They took a plant called Mimosa pudica. They then dropped this plant several times. While they dropped the plant, it would be disturbed, and that would cause it to close up. After dropping it a number of times, the plant would no longer close up in response to that action. They then claim that the fern, which is what this is, has learned to not respond to that particular stimuli. As you can imagine, the claim that the plant learnt to react to it in a particular way is controversial, and is why the original attempt to have it published was rejected by 10 journals. The thing that comes out of this is that the plant had, at least in theory, figured out what it could safely ignore. This means it could put resources that would go into dealing with that stimuli into other things that were more important. The way they made sure that what was happening wasn't just that the plant had become worn out, and that that's why it stopped responding, was that they took a different approach, and instead of dropping it, they shook the plants instead. The plants would respond to the shaking initially, but not the dropping. This meant that they could differentiate between the two events. They also continued to remember this particular situation for more than a month. That means that they had a long-term memory of a sort. We then need to talk about communication between plants. What we do now in this very video is a form of communication, and often the mutually beneficial one. The same thing occurs in land-based plants, and particularly where the plant has a close relationship with a fungi, often being practically symbiotic. The symbiotic relationship between a fungi and a tr tree or other plant is often coined with the term mycorrhiza. That partnership means that the fungus colonizes the root of the plant, providing it with benefit often in the form of nutrients, and in exchange, the tree provides the fungi with nutrients. These occur at different times and places. The best known example of this is your truffle. We mentioned that trees can produce their own neurotransmitters, and that internally they can communicate this way. Well, as far back as 1997, research coming out of the University of British Columbia found that trees could not just communicate, but that they could also move material in the form of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus via the mycorrhiza between both the Douglas fir and paper birch trees. That is two different species. There are also examples from 2013 in which tomatoes and broad beans could communicate using that fungal network, but this was to give warning of a threat, specifically aphids. They were able to give a signal indicating that they were under attack by the aphids, and that would let the local plants that were not yet under attack know. This was facilitated via the fungi. Those that did not have mycelia to support them, that being the fungal system, the mycorrhiza, were not warned, and therefore did not have the same reactions. That means that there's some sort of communication and signal, not just between the plants of one species, but multiple species. This information would largely be unnecessary, if not for the fact that the plants could learn, and there's been evidence of this. 
that plants can learn about their world and make judgments as to what is both beneficial and adverse, that this is a relatively subjective assessment, and that that then allows them to make a choice. Some of this has been done with established trees, such as the Douglas fir and paper birch. Others have been done with seedlings and vegetables. It's the ability to note this across multiple stages of development and multiple species that is important. This leads to one experiment where seedlings were set up in a situation in which they had to choose growth direction based on the light direction. This means they'd either have to move towards the light or away from it. Most plants will move towards the light. The decision the plant had to make was where the light would be available the next time it came on. This was done by using a conditioning stimulus. That is, they would repeatedly expose it to the same reliable source of light. And they'd also do another study where they used a predictor for where the light would come from. This meant that the plant would have to make a decision, even if that predictor was not there. What they found was that the use of a conditioning stimulus was not necessary, but that it was generally a more strong indicator of where the plant would choose to grow towards, that the plant would respond to that stimuli. This is, in a manner of speaking, problem solving. Now the downside to this research is that it wasn't particularly reliable in all aspects. There were issues to do with whether or not plants were following certain behaviours, whether or not they were going with their positive tropism, that is to follow the light, or if there were issues with circadian rhythms and more that would influence whether or not the plant was actually trying to problem solve, acting on memory or anything else. So far we've been able to describe memory and recall from plants, that they can to a degree solve problems if we're not entirely certain about how well, that they can learn and that they can communicate. Four strong indicators of plant intelligence. And while we are not near the point of Audrey, plants are more intelligent than we give them credit for. We are also fortunate that our native terrestrial flora are not in fact aliens that desire our blood. In fact, as one article contests, if plants could truly think and feel, a forest fire would be an event of unimaginable misery and horror, with plants being burnt to death on a scale that can scarcely be grasped. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions that you might have below.